one of the areas where somatically based psychotherapies are going to likely be included uh, increasingly in the future would be the addiction and recovery field. Uh, currently it's, it's, it's still s sort of a new kid on the block when it comes to reintroducing it in a lot of arenas. Uh, what I've noticed is that people that are recovering from heroin addiction, meth addiction, alcohol addiction, or a little of all of the above uh, tend to respond very well to somatic methods. I'm going to tell you a quick story uh, just to help you understand how this stuff applies, some of the other things that are introduced on my channel with interoception, somatic resourcing, um, mindful meditation, pendulation, those sorts of things, and also some of the the older, more traditional uh, methods that are that are also falling into disuse, like parts therapy, which uh, now has sort of a resurgence in in a in a related method, the IFS therapy. So, um, what happened was this this fellow was sitting in a bad neighborhood. I'm going to change enough of the facts so you wouldn't know him if you met him, uh, but he was sitting in a neighborhood where he knew that he could get what only part of him wanted. And he was triggered. He was really triggered. He'd even slipped up the week before and uh, was was trying really hard to stay clean and sober. And so he started doing some of the things that I teach people. He basically started to breathe, do the, the diaphragmatic breathing to access uh, flow within the vagus nerve area, the ventral vagus area. He started to notice where in his body the uh, surge of, of conflict energy was showing up. In his case, if I recall, it was around his chest, uh, somewhere in the upper chest area. And his heart was beating wildly. He wanted to use so bad, but he also didn't want to use. He also was sick of betraying his family. He was sick of being poor. He was sick of being at risk of being arrested and losing his freedom. And so what he started to do is he just started to Breathe, quick breath in, slow breath out, noticing what's tight. And then after he did that for a while, he just really uh, started to identify where the tension was in his chest, how deep beneath the skin it rested, how wide it extended, how, how far uh, high, how far low it went, the, the flow, the sort of dynamic of how it sat and moved and where the intensity was, and it started to differentiate. Uh, and for, for him, this was good because it helped him stay intentional, even though he was extremely triggered. And so what he did was, uh, as, as he breathed and as he noticed it, and as the differentiation process started to happen, uh, he started to use uh, sort of a, an older NLP technique that's often used for anxiety. And it was one of the things that, uh, that I taught him, which basically he gave it a color, he asked himself questions like, which way is it spinning? He, he would uh, then nudge it to see if it would reverse the spin or do something else. What would happen? Uh, I'd, I'd already taught him that you're not uh, to try to strong arm the survival system. What you do is you partner with it. It's sort of a neocortical, subcortical partnership. And it was actually holding him pretty well. What ended up happening was uh, the feeling would dissipate just a bit. But unlike with a simple headache or with a, a light triggering, this was a heavy triggering. And it just kept coming on back. And so he went to, and this is before he didn't understand the uh, resourcing and pendulation part yet. He only understood this, to this other stuff. So he, so he didn't do resourcing and pendulation. He just stayed with interoception and some of these other sort of uh, mental ninja tactics that I've often taught people. And so he started doing traditional parts therapy, essentially. He, he basically just started talking to it like it was a part. Talking to this sort of image of a color in his mind that was connected with the feeling in his chest. And he started asking it questions like, so tell me, uh, what is it that you really want? And the answer is, when you ask with the linguistic system and this neocortical subcortical partnership, once the partnership is on, the body, which is always talking with you anyway and giving you messages, will be out the, the channels, the information comes back through your language system. The more intensely you ask, the quicker the answer comes back. And he understood this. So he asked intensely, what is it that you want? And the answer popped back, uh, I want, I think it was freedom. He's like, okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, and he didn't stop there. He said, now there's a reason why freedom is so important to you. Uh, even deeper, what really matters to you? What do you want? The answer popped back, I want pleasure. And he uh, takes a quick breath in, 
slow breath out, puts on his non-judgmentalness. He's basically uh, reifying a part of his body so that he can use his language system to communicate with himself. Fact is, he understood we live in parts, the parts are sometimes in conflict, and the communication and collaboration is what actually heals, rather than trying to strong-arm things or shove things or force things or shove in chemical mandates uh, with pills and stuff. Uh, aside from so the, the appropriate psych meds that might give you more clarity. And so in his case, as he continued with this line of questioning, he would get answers such as freedom, uh, autonomy, power to do what I want to do. And as, as the answers started repeating themselves, he said, okay, this is as far as I'm going to take it right now. And he was, he was in this state where he did not hate the part of him that was triggered. He didn't hate the part of him that was in conflict with his values. Instead, he was sort of looking compassionately at this piece of himself, uh, which is how the neocortical subpartnership really works when it works. And then finally, he did something that he'd often done with himself before, but it never worked like it did this time. This time he was in deep partnership with his body, and he said, you know, if I were to do what I kind of partly want to do and go and use right now, what's going to happen is, is I'm not going to have freedom, not really. I'm not going to have pleasure that lasts. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be poor again. I'm going to be betraying my family again. I'm going to be violating my values and uh, putting myself at great risk of losing my freedom uh, to, to the law and at least losing my moral freedom. Tell me, is there a better way? And so what ended up happening is like he get, got this flood of thoughts rushing back to him, stuff that was probably in his relapse prevention plan, things that he could do elsewise, things that were already uh, things that he knew would be good when he's thinking straight. Uh, however, this time they didn't just come as thoughts. This time they came with deep, palpable relief. The, the tension in his chest felt as though it folded into itself, and in its wake, waves of goodness rushing through his body. Now the thing is, he was still triggered. But his triggering was about 20% of the intensity that it was before. We're talking about an 80% knockdown of intensity. The energy being thus discharged, what he ended up doing is he ended up just laughing at the, the triggering and saying, well, I guess that's just one of the choices and uh, I've got a lot of better ones. And he just left. He left uh, with a sense of mastery, uh, with a sense of uh, confidence, renewed confidence, and for him, uh, he's been triggered since then, and it kept coming back about, again, 20, maybe 30 percent of the intensity that he usually gets, and now he faces it with deep, deep, rich confidence that he knows uh, he has something that he can do with his energy when it comes up, and uh, the, the thing is, here's, here's the important thing to know for if you're struggling in the throes of addiction and often finding yourself uh, ashamed and triggered uh, with because you're thinking, oh my gosh, I've done all this work, I have all these things that matter to me, how in the world is this happening? Uh, the thing is, when the conflict comes up, and it does, you know, you're, you're looking for your relief or whatever you're looking for and drugs or other things or, or, or other addictions are ways of getting it, uh, even though they don't last, your brain's going to go there. And so... So what I want to explain to you is that when you release that energy, when you reclaim it as yours, when you take it and instead of fighting it and white-knuckling and barely surviving with your addiction, being able to actually reclaim that energy and let it flow through you in a, in a cooperative way, it feels absolutely marvelous. Uh, the thing is, uh, eventually, if you get confident at this, you'll, you'll get, as some guys do, to the point where you thank your lucky stars when you're driving down the street and an inexplicable feeling of dread comes over you. You're going to say to yourself something like, oh, thank goodness this pain came. Now that I'm looking around, I'm orienting and seeing that I'm not really in danger. Let's breathe. Let's feel this. Let's metabolize the energy and the, and the, the angst that's in me and start to get some power and relief out of it. Start to unlock it for the energy that it is. And, and that feels absolutely great. This fellow that I told you about, he's experiencing it now. You can experience it. It takes work. But the methods are simple. They're absolutely not easy. Because it's easy to forget. And it's easy to stop believing that it'll work. But when you do the work, it'll help you with pain. It'll help you with anxiety. It'll help you with the gnawing sense of emptiness or dissatisfaction, wanderlust, or whatever it is that you're dealing with. Uh, so definitely take a look at my videos. If you want to be able to get updates, absolutely subscribe. It helps me if you subscribe uh, and, and uh, like the videos. 
and enjoy them. Enjoy the power that's yours. Enjoy the resources that are yours. And thanks for watching.